Hiroshima by John Hersey, Chapter 2, The Fire Immediately after the explosion, the Reverend Mr. Kiyoshi Tanamoto, having run wildly out of the Matsui estate and having looked in wonderment at the bloody soldiers at the mouth of the dugout they had been digging, attached himself sympathetically to an old lady who was walking along in a daze, holding her head with her left hand, supporting a small boy of three or four on her back with her right, and crying, I'm hurt, I'm hurt, I'm hurt. Mr. Tanamoto transferred the child to his own back and led the woman by the hand down the street, which was darkened by what seemed to be a local column of dust. He took the woman to a grammar school not far away that had previously been designated for use as a temporary hospital in case of emergency. By this solicitous behavior, Mr. Tanamoto had once got rid of his terror. At the school, he was much surprised to see glass all over the floor and 50 or 60 injured people already waiting to be treated. He reflected that, although the all-clear had sounded and he had heard no planes, several bombs must have been dropped. He thought of a hillock in the rayon man's garden from which he could get a view of the whole of Koi, of the whole of Hiroshima for that matter, and he ran back up to the estate. From the mound, Mr. Tanamoto saw an astonishing panorama, not just a patch of koi as he had expected, but as much of Hiroshima as he could see through the clouded air was giving off a thick, dreadful miasma. Clumps of smoke, near and far, had begun to push up through the general dust. He wondered how such extensive damage could have been dealt out of a silent sky. Even a few planes, far up, would have been audible. Houses nearby were burning, and when huge drops of water the size of marbles began to fall, he half thought that they must be coming from the hoses of firemen fighting the blazes. They were actually drops of condensed moisture falling from the turbulent tower of dust, heat, and fission fragments that had already risen miles into the sky above Hiroshima. Mr. Tanamoto turned away from the site when he heard Mr. Matsuo call out to ask whether he was all right. Mr. Matsuo had been safely cushioned within the falling house by the bedding stored in the front hall and had worked his way out. Mr. Tanamoto scarcely answered. He had thought of his wife and baby, his church, his home, his parishioners, all of them down in that awful murk. Once more, he began to run in fear toward the city. Mrs. Hatsuyo Nakamura, the tailor's widow, having struggled up from under the ruins of her house after the explosion, and seeing Maiko, the youngest of her three children, buried breast deep and unable to move, crawled across the debris, hauled at timbers, and flung tiles aside in a hurried effort to free the child. Then, for what, from what seemed to be caverns far below, she heard two small voices crying, Tasukete, Tasukete, help, help. She called the names of her 10-year-old son and 8-year-old daughter. Toshio, Yeiko, the voices from below answered. Mrs. Nakamura abandoned Maiko, who had at least could breathe, and in a frenzy made the wreckage fly above the crying voices. The children had been sleeping nearly 10 feet apart, but now their voices seemed to come from the same place. Toshio, the boy, apparently had some freedom to move because she could feel him undermining the pile of wood and tiles as she worked from above. At last, she saw his head and she hastily pulled him out of it by it. A mosquito net was wound intricately as if it had been carefully wrapped around his feet. He, si he said he had been blown right across the room and had been on top of his sister Yako under the wreckage. She now said from underneath that she could not move because there was something on her legs. With a bit more digging, Mrs. Nakamura cleared a hole above the child and began to pull her arm. Tie, it hurts, Yako cried. Mrs. Nakamura shouted, there's no time now to say whether it hurts or not, and yanked her whimpering daughter up. Then she freed Maiko. The children were filthy and bruised, but none of them had a single cut or scratch. Mrs. Nakamura took the children out into the street. They had nothing on but underpants, and although the day was very hot, she worried rather confusedly about their being cold. So she went back into the wreckage and burrowed underneath and found a bundle of clothes she had packed for an emergency, and she dressed them in pants, blouses, shoes, padded cotton air raid helmets called bakuzuki, and even, irrationally, overcoats. The children were silent except for the five-year-old Maiko who kept asking questions. Why is it night already? Why did our house fall down? What happened? Ms. Nakamura, who did not know what had happened, had not the all-clear sounded, looked around and saw through the darkness that all the houses in her neighborhood had collapsed. The house next door, which its owner had been tearing down to make way for a fire lane, was now very thoroughly, if crudely, torn down.
Its owner, who had been sacrificing his home for the community's safety, lay dead. Ms. Nakamoto, wife of the head of the local air raid defense neighborhood association, came across the street with her head all bloody and said that her baby was badly cut. Did Ms. Nakamura have any bandage? Ms. Nakamura did not, but she crawled into the remains of her house again and pulled out some white cloth that she had been using in her work as a seamstress, ripped it into strips, and gave it to Mrs. Nakamoto. While fetching the cloth, she noticed her sewing machine. She went back in for it and dragged it out. Obviously, she could not carry it with her, so she unthinkingly plunged her symbol of livelihood into the receptacle, which for weeks had been her symbol of safety. The cement tank of water in front of her house, of the type every household had been ordered to construct against a possible fire raid. A nervous neighbor, Mrs. Hataya, called to Mrs. Nakamura to run away with her to the woods in Asano Park, an estate by the Keo River not far off, belonging to the wealthy Asano family, who once owned the Toyo Kisan Kaisha steamship line. The park had been designated as an evacuation area for their neighborhood. Seeing fire breaking out in a nearby ruin, except at the very center where the bomb itself ignited some fires, most of Hiroshima's citywide conflagration was caused by inflammable wreckage falling on cook stoves and live wires. Ms. Nakamura suggested going over to fight it. Mrs. Hataya said, don't be foolish. What if planes come and drop more bombs? So Mrs. Nakamura started out for Asano Park with her children and Mrs. Hataya, and she carried her rucksack of emergency clothing, a blanket, an umbrella, and a suitcase of things she had cached in her air raid shelter. Under many ruins, as they hurried along, they heard muffled screams for help. The only building they saw standing on their way to Asano Park was the Jesuit Mission House, alongside the Catholic kindergarten to which Mrs. Nakamura had sent Maiko for a time. As they passed it, she saw Father Kleinsorg in bloody underwear running out of the house with a small suitcase in his hand. Right after the explosion, while Father Wilhelm Kleinsorg, S.J., was wandering around in his underwear in the vegetable garden, Father Superior LaSalle came around the corner of the building in the darkness. His body, especially his back, was bloody. The flash had made him twist away from his window, and tiny pieces of glass had flown at him. Father Kleinsorg, still bewildered, managed to ask, where are the rest? Just then, the two other priests living in the mission house appeared. Father Cecilic, unhurt, supporting Father Schieffer, who was covered with blood that spurted from a cut above his left ear and who was very pale. Father Cecilic was rather pleased with himself, for after the flash, he had dived into a doorway, which he had previously reckoned to be the safest place inside the building. And when the blast came, he was not injured. Father LaSalle told Father Cecilic to take Father Schieffer to a doctor before he bled to death and suggested either Dr. Kanda, who lived on the next corner, or Dr. Fuji, about six blocks away. The two men went out of the compound and up the street. The daughter of Mr. Hoshijima, the mission catechist, ran up to Father Kleinsword and said that her mother and sister were buried under the ruins of their house, which was at the back of the Jesuit compound, and at the same time, the priest noticed that the house of the Catholic kindergarten teacher at the front of the compound had collapsed on her. While Father LaSalle and Mrs. Murata, the mission housekeeper, dug the teacher out, Father Kleinsword went to the catechist's fallen house and began lifting things off the top of the pile. There was not a sound underneath. He was sure the Hoshijima women had been killed. At last, under what had been a corner of the kitchen, he saw Mrs. Hoshijima's head. Believing her dead, he began to haul her out by the hair, but suddenly she screamed, a tie, a tie, it hurts, it hurts. He dug some more and lifted her out. He managed, too, to find her daughter in the rubble and free her. Neither was badly hurt. A public bath next door to the mission house had caught fire, but since there the wind was southerly, the priests thought their house would be spared. Nevertheless, as a precaution, Father Kleinsward went inside to fetch some things he wanted to save. He found his room in a state of weird and illogical confusion. A first aid kit was hanging undisturbed on a hook on the wall, but his clothes, which had been on other hooks nearby, were nowhere to be seen. His desk was in splinters all over the room, but a mere paper mache suitcase, which he had hidden under the desk, stood handle side up, without a scratch on it in the doorway of the room where he could not miss it. Father Kleinsorg later came to regard this as a bit of providential interference.
Inasmuch as the suitcase contained his breviary, the account books for the whole diocese, and a considerable amount of paper money belonging to the mission for which he was responsible, he ran out of the house and deposited the suitcase in the mission air raid shelter. At about this time, Father Seaslake and Father Schieffer, who was still spurting blood, came back and said that Dr. Kanda's house was ruined and that fire blocked them from getting out of what they supposed to be the local circle of destruction to Dr. Fuji's private hospital on the bank of the Kyo River. Dr. Masakazu Fuji's hospital was no longer on the bank of the Kyo River. It was in the river. After the overturn, Dr. Fuji was so stupefied and so tightly squeezed by the beams gripping his chest that he was unable to move at first, and he hung there about 20 minutes in the darkened morning. Then a thought which came to him that soon the tide would be running in through the estuaries and his head would be submerged inspired him to fearful activity he wriggled and turned and exerted what strength he could though his left arm because of the pain in his shoulder was useless and before long he had freed himself from the vise after a few moments rest he climbed onto the pile of timbers and finding a long one that slanted up to the river bank he painfully shinnied up it Dr. Fuji, who was in his underwear, was now soaking and dirty. His undershirt was torn, and blood ran down it from bad cuts on his chin and back. In this disarray, he walked out onto Keo Bridge, beside which his hospital had stood. The bridge had not collapsed. He could see only fuzzily without his glasses, but he could see enough to be amazed at the number of houses that were down all around. On the bridge, he encountered a friend, a doctor named Machi, and asked in bewilderment, What do you think it was? Dr. Machi said, it must have been a Molotovano Hanakago, a Molotov flower basket, the delicate Japanese name for the bread basket, or self-scattering cluster of bombs. At first, Dr. Fuji could see only two fires, one across the river from his hospital site and one quite far to the south. But at the same time, he and his friend observed something that puzzled them and which, as doctors, they discussed. Although there were as yet very few fires, wounded people were hurrying across the bridge in an endless parade of misery, and many of them exhibited terrible burns on their faces and arms. Why do you suppose it is? Dr. Fuji asked. Even a theory was comforting that day, and Dr. Machi stuck to his perhaps because it was a Molotov flower basket, he said. There had been no breeze earlier in the morning when Dr. Fuji had walked to the railway station to see his friend off. But now brisk winds were blowing every which way. Here on the bridge, the wind was easterly. New fires were leaping up and they spread quickly. And in a very short time, terrible blasts of hot air and showers of cinders made it impossible to stand on the bridge anymore. Dr. Machi ran to the far side of the river and along a still, unkindled street. Dr. Fuji went down into the water under the bridge where a score of people had already taken refuge, among them his servants, who had extricated themselves from the wreckage. From there, Dr. Fuji saw a nurse hanging in the timbers of his hospital by her legs, and then another painfully pinned across the breast. He enlisted the help of some of the others under the bridge and freed both of them. He thought he heard the voice of his niece for a moment, but he could not find her. He never saw her again. Four of his nurses and the two patients in the hospital died too. Dr. Fuji went back into the water of the river and waited for the fire to subside. The lot of doctors Fuji, Kanda, and Machi, right after the explosion, and as these three were typical, that of the majority of the physicians and surgeons of Hiroshima, with their offices and hospitals destroyed, their equipment scattered, their own bodies incapacitated in varying degrees, explained why so many citizens who were hurt went untended, and why so many who might have lived died. Of 150 doctors in the city, 65 were already dead, and most of the rest were wounded. Of 1,780 nurses, 1,654 were dead or too badly hurt to work. In the biggest hospital, that of the Red Cross, only six doctors out of 30 were able to function, and only 10 nurses out of more than 200. The sole uninjured doctor on the Red Cross hospital staff was Dr. Sasaki. After the explosion, he hurried to a storeroom to fetch bandages. This room, like everything he had seen as he ran through the hospital, was chaotic. Bottles of medicine thrown off shelves and broken. Salves spattered on the walls. Instruments strewn everywhere. He grabbed up some bandages and an unbroken bottle of mercurochrome, hurried back to the chief surgeon, and bandaged his cuts. Then he went out into the corridor and began patching up the wounded patients and the doctors and nurses there. He blundered so without his glasses that he took a pair off the face of a wounded nurse, and although they only 
approximately compensated for the errors of his vision, they were better than nothing. He was depend on he was to depend on them for more than a month. Dr. Sasaki worked without method, taking those who were nearest him first, and he noticed soon that the corridor seemed to be getting more and more crowded. Mixed in with the abrasions and lacerations which most people in the hospital had suffered, he began to find dreadful burns. He realized then that casualties were pouring in from outdoors. There were so many that he began to pass up the lightly wounded. He decided that all he could hope to do was to stop people from bleeding to death. Before long, patients lay and crouched on the floors of the wards and the laboratories and all the other rooms, and in the corridors and on the stairs and in the front hall and under the porte cochere and on the stone front steps and in the driveway and courtyard and for blocks each way in the streets outside. Wounded people supported maimed people. Disfigured families leaned together. Many people were vomiting. A tremendous number of schoolgirls, some of those who had been taken from their classrooms to work outdoors, clearing fire lanes, crept into the hospital. In a city of 245,000, nearly 100,000 people had been killed or doomed at one blow. 100,000 more were hurt. At least 10,000 of the wounded made their way to the best hospital in town, which was altogether unequal to such a trampling since it had only 600 beds and they had all been occupied. The people in the suffocating crowd inside the hospital wept and cried for Dr. Sasaki to hear Sensei, Doctor, and the less seriously wounded came and pulled at his sleeve and begged him to go to the aid of the worst wounded. Tugged here and there in his stockinged feet, bewildered by the numbers, staggered by so much raw flesh, Dr. Sasaki Sasaki lost all sense of profession and stopped working as a skillful surgeon and a sympathetic man. He became an automaton, mechanically wiping, daubing, winding, wiping, daubing, winding. Some of the wounded in Hiroshima were unable to enjoy the questionable luxury of hospitalization. In what had been the personnel office of the East Asia Tin Works, Miss Sasaki lay doubled over, unconscious, under the tremendous pile of books and plaster and wood and corrugated iron. She was wholly unconscious, she later estimated, for about three hours. Her first sensation was of dreadful pain in her left leg. It was so black under the books and debris that the borderline between awareness and unconsciousness was fine. She immediately crossed it several times, for the pain seemed to come and go. At the moments when it was sharpest, she felt that her leg had been cut off somewhere below the knee. Later, she heard someone walking on top of the wreckage above her, and anguished voices spoke up, evidently from within the mess around her. Please help. Get us out. Father Kleinsorg stemmed Father Schiffer's spurting cut as well as he could with some bandage that Dr. Fuji had given the priests a few days before. When he finished, he ran into the mission house again and found the jacket of his military uniform and an old pair of gray trousers. He put them on and went outside. A woman from next door ran up to him and shouted that her husband was buried under her house and the house was on fire. Father Kleinsorg must come and save him. Father Kleinsorg, already growing apathetic and dazed in the presence of the cumulative distress, said we haven't much time houses all around were burning and the wind was now blowing hard do you know exactly which part of the house he is under he asked yes yes she said come quickly they went around to the house the remains of which blazed violently but when they got there it turned out that the woman had no idea where her husband was father Kleinsworth shouted several times is anyone there there was no answer Father Kleinsword said to the woman, We must get away or we will all die. He went back to the Catholic compound and told the Father Superior that the fire was coming closer on the wind, which had swung around and was now from the north. It was time for everybody to go. Just then, the kindergarten teacher pointed out to the priest, Mr. Fukai, the secretary of the diocese, who was standing in his window on the second floor of the mission house, facing in the direction of the explosion, weeping. Father Seaslick, because he thought the stairs unusable, ran around to the back of the mission house to look for a ladder. There he heard people crying for help under a nearby fallen roof. He called to passers-by, running away in the street to help him lift it, but nobody paid any attention, and he had to leave the buried ones to die. Father Kleinsorg ran inside the mission house and scrambled up the stairs, which were awry and piled with plaster and lathing, and called to Mr. Fukai from the doorway of his room. Mr. Fukai, a very short man of about 50, turned around slowly with a queer look and said, Leave me here. Father Kleinsorg went into the room and took Mr. Fukai by the collar of his coat and said, Come with me or you'll die. Mr. Fukai said, Leave me here to die.
Father Klingsorg began to shove and haul Mr. Fukai out of the room. Then the theological student came up and grabbed Mr. Fukai's feet, and Father Klingsorg took his shoulders, and together they carried him downstairs and outdoors. I can't walk, Mr. Fukai cried. Leave me here. Father Klinesorg got his paper suitcase with the money in it and took Mr. Fukai up pickaback, and the party started for the East Parade Ground, their district's safe area. As they went out of the gate, Mr. Fukai, quite childlike now, beat on Father Klinesorg's shoulders and said, I won't leave, I won't leave. Irrelevantly, Father Klinesorg turned to Father LaSalle and said, We have lost all our possessions, but not our sense of humor. The street was cluttered with parts of houses that had slid into it, and with fallen telephone poles and wires, from every second or third house came the voices of people buried and abandoned, who invariably screamed with formal politeness, Tasukete cure, help if you please. The priest recognized several ruins from which these cries came as the homes of friends, but because of the fire, it was too late to help. All the way, Mr. Fukai whimpered, let me stay. The party turned right when they came to a block of fallen houses that was one flame. At Sakai Bridge, which would take them across to the East Parade Ground, they saw that the whole community on the opposite side of the river was a sheet of fire. They dared not cross and decided to take refuge in Asano Park, off to their left. Father Kleinsorg, who had been weakened for a couple of days by his bad case of diarrhea, began to stagger under his protesting burden, and as he tried to climb up over the wreckage of several houses that blocked their way to the park, he stumbled, dropped Mr. Fukai, and plunged down, head over heels, to the edge of the river. When he picked himself up, he saw Mr. Fukai running away. Father Kleinsorg shouted to a dozen soldiers who were standing by the bridge to stop him. As Father Kleinsorg started back to get Mr. Fukai, Father LaSalle called out, Hurry, don't waste time. So Father Kleinsorg just requested the soldiers to take care of Mr. Fukai. They said they would, but the little, broken man got away from them, and the last the priest could see of him, he was running back toward the fire. Mr. Tanamoto, fearful for his family and church, at first ran toward them by the shortest route, along Koi Highway. He was the only person making his way into the city. He met hundreds and hundreds who were fleeing, and every one of them seemed to be hurt in some way. The eyebrows of some were burned off, and skin hung from their faces and hands. Others, because of pain, held their arms up as if carrying something in both hands. Some were vomiting as they walked. Many were naked or in shreds of clothing. On some undressed bodies, the burns had made patterns of undershirt straps and suspenders, and on the skin of some women, since white repelled the heat from the bomb and dark clothes absorbed it and conducted it to the skin, the shapes of flowers they had had on their kimonos. Many, although injured themselves, supported relatives who were worse off. Almost all had their heads bowed, looked straight ahead, were silent, and showed no expression whatever. After crossing Koi Bridge and Cannon Bridge, having run the whole way, Mr. Tanamoto saw as he approached the center that all the houses had been crushed and many were afire. Here the trees were bare and their trunks were charred. He tried at several points to penetrate the ruins but the flames always stopped him. Under many houses, people screamed for help, but no one helped. In general, survivors that day assisted only their relatives or immediate neighbors, for they could not comprehend or tolerate a wider circle of misery. The wounded limped past the screams, and Mr. Tanamoto ran past them. As a Christian, he was filled with compassion for those who were trapped, and as a Japanese, he was overwhelmed by the shame of being unhurt, and he prayed as he ran. God help them and take them out of the fire. He thought he would skirt the fire to the left. He ran back to Cannon Bridge and followed for a distance one of the rivers. He tried several cross streets, but all were blocked, so he turned far left and ran out to Yokogawa, a station on a railroad line that detoured the city in a wide semicircle, and he followed the rails until he came to a burning train. So impressed was he by his time, by the extent of the damage that he ran north two miles to Guyon, a suburb in the foothills. All the way, he overtook dreadfully burned and lacerated people, and in his guilt, he turned to right and left as he hurried and said to some of them, "'Excuse me for having no burden like yours.'" Near Guyon, he began to meet country people going toward the city to help, and when they saw him, several exclaimed, "'Look, there is one who is not wounded.'" At Guyon, he bore toward the right bank of the main river, the Ota, and ran down it until he reached fire again. There was no fire on the other side of the river, so he threw off his shirt and shoes and plunged into it. In midstream, where the current was fairly strong, exhaustion and fear finally caught up with him. He had run nearly seven miles, and he became limp and drifted in 
in the water. He prayed, please God, help me to cross. It would be nonsense for me to be drowned when I am the only uninjured one. He managed a few more strokes and fetched up on a spit downstream. Mr. Tanamoto climbed up the bank and ran along it until near a large Shinto shrine he came to more fire, and as he turned left to get around it, he met, by incredible luck, his wife. She was carrying their infant daughter. Mr. Tanamoto was now so emotionally worn out that nothing could surprise him. He did not embrace his wife. He simply said, oh, you are safe. She told him that she had got home from her night in Ushida just in time for the explosion. She had been buried under the parsonage with the baby in her arms. She told how the wreckage had pressed down on her, how the baby had cried. She saw a chink of light and by reaching up with a hand, she worked the hole bigger bit by bit. After about half an hour, she heard the crackling noise of wood burning. At last, the opening was big enough for her to push the baby out, and afterward, she crawled out herself. She said she was now going out to Ushida again. Mr. Tanamoto said he wanted to see his church and take care of the people of his neighborhood association. They parted as casually, as bewildered, as they had met. Mr. Tanamoto's way around the fire took him across the East Parade Ground, which, being an evacuation area, was now the scene of a gruesome review, rank on rank of the burned and bleeding. Those who were burned moaned, Mizu, Mizu, water, water. Mr. Tanamoto found a basin in a nearby street and located a water tap that still worked in the crushed shell of a house, and he began carrying water to the suffering strangers. When he had given drink to about 30 of them, he realized he was taking too much time. Excuse me, he said loudly to those nearby who were reaching out their hands to him and crying their thirst. I have many people to take care of. Then he ran away. He went to the river again, the base in his hand, and jumped down onto a sand spit. There he saw hundreds of people so badly wounded that they could not get up to go farther from the burning city. When they saw a man erect and unhurt, the chant began again, Mizu, Mizu, Mizu. Mr. Tanamoto could not resist them. He carried them water from the river, a mistake since it was tidal and brackish. Two or three small boats were ferrying hurt people across the river from Asano Park, and when one touched the spit, Mr. Tanamoto again made his loud, apologetic speech and jumped on into the boat. It took him across to the park. There in the underbrush, he found some of his charges of the neighborhood association, who had come there by his previous instructions, and saw many acquaintances, among them Father Kleinsorg and the other Catholics, but he missed Fukai, who had been a close friend. Where is Fukai-san? he asked. He didn't want to come with us, Father Kleinsorg said. He ran back. When Miss Sasaki heard the voices of the people caught along with her in the dilapidation at the tin factory, she began speaking to them. Her nearest neighbor, she discovered, was a high school girl who had been drafted for factory work and who said her back was broken. Miss Sasaki replied, I am lying here and I can't move. My left leg is cut off. Sometime later, she again heard somebody walk overhead and then move off to one side, and whoever it was began burrowing. The digger released several people, and when he had uncovered the high school girl, she found that her back was not broken after all and she crawled out. Miss Sasaki spoke to the rescuer and he worked toward her. He pulled away a great number of books until he had made a tunnel to her. She could see his perspiring face as he said, come out miss. She said, I can't move. The man excavated some more and told her to try with all her strength to get out but books were heavy on her hips and the man finally saw that a bookcase was leaning on the books and that a heavy beam pressed down on the bookcase wait he said i'll get a crowbar the man was gone a long time and when he came back he was ill-tempered as if her plight were all her fault we have no men to help you he shouted in through the tunnel you'll have to get out by yourself that's impossible she said my left leg the man went away much later, several men came and dragged Miss Sasaki out. Her left leg was not severed, but it was badly broken and cut, and it hung askew below the knee. They took her out into a courtyard. It was raining. She sat on the ground in the rain. When the downpour increased, someone directed all the wounded people to take cover in the factory's air raid shelters. Come along, a torn up woman said to her. You can hop. But Miss Sasaki could not move, and she just waited in the rain. Then a man propped up a large sheet of corrugated iron as a kind of lean to and took her in his arms and carried her to it. She was grateful until he brought two horribly wounded people, a woman with a whole breast sheared off and a man whose face was all raw from a burn, to share the simple shed with her. No one came back. The rain cleared and the cloudy afternoon was hot. Before nightfall, the three grotesques under the slanting piece of twisted iron began to smell quite bad. 
The former head of the Nobori Cho Neighborhood Association, to which the Catholic priest belonged, was an energetic man named Yoshida. He had boasted when he was in charge of the district air raid defenses that fire might eat away all of Hiroshima, but it would never come to Nobori Cho. The bomb blew down his house and a joist pinned him by the legs in full view of the Jesuit mission house across the way and of the people hurrying along the street. In their confusion as they hurried past, Mrs. Nakamura with her children and Father Kleinsorg with Mr. Fukai on his back hardly saw him. He was just part of the general blur of misery through which they moved. His cries for help brought no response from them. There were so many people shouting for help that they could not hear him separately. They and all the others went along. Nobori Cho became came absolutely deserted, and the fire swept through it. Mr. Yoshida saw the wooden mission house, the only erect building in the area, go up in a lick of flame, and the heat was terrific on his face. Then flames came along his side of the street and entered his house. In a paroxysm of terrified strength, he freed himself and ran down the alleys of Nobori Cho, hemmed in by the fire he had said would never come. He began at once to behave like an old man. Two months later, his hair was white. As Dr. Fuji stood in the river up to his neck to avoid the heat of the fire, the wind blew stronger and stronger, and soon, even though the expanse of water was small, the waves grew so high that the people under the bridge could no longer keep their footing. Dr. Fuji went close to the shore, crouched down, and embraced a large stone with his usable arm. Later, it became possible to wade along the very edge of the river, and Dr. Fuji and his two surviving nurses moved about 200 yards upstream to a sands pit near Asano Park. Many wounded were lying on the sand. Dr. Machi was there with his family. His daughter, who had been outdoors when the bomb burst, was badly burned on her hands and legs, but fortunately not on her face. Although Dr. Fuji's shoulder was by now terribly painful, he examined the girl's burns curiously. Then he lay down. In spite of the misery all around, he was ashamed of his appearance, and he remarked to Dr. Machi, that he looked like a beggar, dressed as he was in nothing but torn and bloody underwear. Later in the afternoon, when the fire began to subside, he decided to go to his parental house in the suburb of Nagatsuka. He asked Dr. Machi to join him, but the doctor answered that he and his family were going to spend the night on the spit because of his daughter's injuries. Dr. Fuji, together with his nurses, walked first to Ushida, where in the partially damaged houses of some relatives, he found first aid materials he had stored there. The two nurses bandaged him and he them. They went on. Now not many people walked in the streets, but a great number sat and lay on the pavement, vomited, waited for death, and died. The number of corpses on the way to Nagatsuka was more and more puzzling. The doctor wondered, could a Molotov flower basket have done all this? Dr. Fuji reached his family's house in the evening. It was five miles from the center of town, but its roof had fallen in and the windows were all broken. All day, people poured into Asano Park. This private estate was far enough away from the explosion so that its bamboos, pines, laurel, and maples were still alive, and the green place invited refugees, partly because they believed that if the Americans came back, they would bomb only buildings, partly because the foliage seemed a center of coolness and life, and the estate's exquisitely precise rock gardens with their quiet pools and arching bridges were very Japanese, normal, secure, and also partly, according to some who were there, because of an irresistible atavistic urge to hide under leaves. Mrs. Nakamura and her children were among the first to arrive, and they settled in the bamboo grove near the river. They all felt terribly thirsty, and they drank from the river. At once, they were nauseated and began vomiting, and they wretched the whole day. Others were also nauseated. They all thought, probably because of the strong odor of ionization and electric smell given off by the bomb's fission, that they were sick from a gas the Americans had dropped. When Father Kleinsorg and the other priests came into the park, nodding to their friends as they passed, the Nakamuras were all sick and prostrate. A woman named Iwasaki, who lived in the neighborhood of the mission and who was sitting near the Nakamuras, got up and asked the priests if she should stay where she was or go with them. Father Kleinsorg said, I hardly know where the safest place is. She stayed there, and later in the day, though she had no visible burns or or wounds, she died. The priest went farther along the river and settled down in some underbrush. Father LaSalle lay down and went right to sleep. The theological student, who was wearing slippers, had carried with him a bundle of clothes in which he had packed two pairs of leather shoes. When he sat down with the others, he found that the bundle had broken open and a couple of shoes had fallen out, and now he had only two lefts. He retraced the steps and found one right. 
When he rejoined the priest, he said, It's funny, but things don't matter anymore. Yesterday, my shoes were my most important possessions. Today, I don't care. One pair is enough. Father Cecilic said, I know. I started to bring my books along, and then I thought, This is no time for books. When Mr. Tanamoto, with his basin still in his hand, reached the park, it was very crowded, and to distinguish the living from the dead was not easy, for most of the people lay still with their eyes open. To Father Kleinsorg and Occidental, the silence in the grove by the river, where hundreds of gruesomely wounded suffered together, was one of the most dreadful and awesome phenomena of his whole experience. The hurt ones were quiet, no one wept, much less screamed in pain, no one complained, None of the many who died did so noisily. Not even the children cried. Very few people even spoke. And when Father Kleinsor gave water to some whose faces had been almost blotted out by flash burns, they took their share and then raised themselves a little and bowed to him in thanks. Mr. Tanamoto greeted the priests and then looked around for other friends. He saw Mrs. Matsumoto, wife of the director of the Methodist school, and asked her if she was thirsty. She was, so he went to one of the pools in the Asano Rock Gardens and got water for her in his basin. Then he decided to try to get back to his church. He went into Nobori Cho by the way the priests had taken as they escaped, but he did not get far. The fire along the streets was so fierce that he had to turn back. He walked to the riverbank and began to look for a boat in which he might carry some of the most severely injured across the river from Asano Park and away from the spreading fire. Soon he found a good-sized pleasure punt drawn up on the bank, but in and around it was an awful tableau. Five dead men, nearly naked, badly burned, who must have expired more or less all at once, for they were in attitudes which suggested that they had been working together to push the boat down into the river. Mr. Tanamoto lifted them away from the boat, and as he did so, he experienced such horror at disturbing the dead, preventing them, he momentarily felt, from launching their craft and going on their ghostly way, that he said out loud, Please forgive me for taking this boat. I must use it for others who are alive. The punt was heavy, but he managed to slide it into the water. There were no oars, and all he could find for propulsion was a thick bamboo pole. He worked the boat upstream to the most crowded part of the park and began to ferry the wounded. He could pack ten or twelve into the boat for but each But as crossing. the river was too deep in the center to pull his way across, he had to paddle with the bamboo, and consequently each trip took a very long time. He worked several hours that way. Early in the afternoon, the fire swept into the woods of Asano Park. The first Mr. Tanamona knew of it was when, returning in his boat, he saw that a great number of people had moved toward the riverside. On touching the bank, he went up to investigate, and when he saw the fire, he shouted, All the young men who are not badly hurt, come with me. Father Kleinsorg moved Father Schieffer and Father LaSalle close to the edge of the river and asked people there to get them across if the fire came too near, and then joined Tanamoto's volunteers. Mr. Tanamoto sent some to look for buckets and basins and told others to beat the burning underbrush with their clothes. When utensils were at hand, he formed a bucket chain from one of the pools in the rock gardens. The team fought the fire for more than two hours and gradually defeated the flames. As Mr. Tanamoto's men worked, the frightened people in the park pressed closer and closer to the river, and finally the mob began to force some of the unfortunates who were on the very bank into the water. Among those driven into the river and drowned were Mrs. Matsumoto of the Methodist School and her daughter. When Father Kleinsorg got back after fighting the fire, he found Father Schieffer still bleeding and terribly pale. Some Japanese stood around and stared at him, and Father Schieffer whispered with a weak smile, It is as if I were already dead. Not yet, Father Kleinsorg said. He had brought Dr. Fuji's first aid kit with him, and he had noticed Dr. Kanda in the crowd, so he sought him out and asked him if he would dress Father Schieffer's bad cuts. Dr. Kanda had seen his wife and daughter dead in the ruins of his hospital. He sat now with his head in his hands. I can't do anything, he said. Father Kleinsorg bound more bandage around Father Schieffer's head, moved him to a steep place, and settled him so that his head was high, and soon the bleeding diminished. The roar of approaching planes was heard about this time. Someone in the crowd near the Nakamura family shouted, It's some Grumman's coming to strafe us. A baker named Nakashima stood up and commanded, Everyone who is wearing anything white, take it off. Mrs. Nakamura took the blouses off her children and opened her umbrella and made them get under it. A great number of people, even badly burned ones, crawled into bushes and stayed there until the home, evidently of a reconnaissance or weather run, died away.
It began to rain. Mrs. Nakamura kept her children under the umbrella. The drops grew abnormally large, and someone shouted, The Americans are dropping gasoline. They're going to set fire to us. This alarm stemmed from one of the theories being passed through the park as to why so much of Hiroshima had burned. It was that a single plane had sprayed gasoline on the city and then somehow set fire to it in one flashing moment. But the drops were palpably water, and as they fell, the wind grew stronger and stronger, and suddenly, probably because of the tremendous convection set up by the blazing city, a whirlwind ripped through the park. Huge trees crashed down, small ones were uprooted and flew into the air. Higher, a wild array of flat things revolved in the twisting funnel, pieces of iron roofing, papers, doors, strips of matting. Father Kleinsorg put a piece of cloth over Father Schieffer's eyes so that the feeble man would not think he was going crazy. The gale blew Mrs. Murata, the mission housekeeper, who was sitting close by the river, down the embankment at a shallow, rocky place, and she came out with her bare feet bloody. The vortex moved out onto the river, where it sucked up a water spout and eventually spent itself. After the storm, Mr. Tanamoto began ferrying people again, and Father Kleinsorg asked the theological student to go across and make his way out to the Jesuit novitiate at Nagatsuka. About three miles from the center of town, and to request the priest there to come with help for Fathers Schieffer and LaSalle, the student got into Mr. Tanamoto's boat and went off with him. Father Kleinsorg asked Mrs. Nakamura if she would like to go out to Nagatsuka with the priest when they came. She said she had some luggage and her children were sick. They were still vomiting from time to time, and so, for that matter, was she, and therefore she feared she could not. He said he thought the fathers from the novitiate could come back the next day with a pushcart to get her. Late in the afternoon, when he went ashore for a while, Mr. Tanomoto, upon whose energy and initiative many had come to depend, heard people begging for food. He consulted Father Kleinsorg, and they decided to go back into town to get some rice from Mr. Tanomoto's neighborhood association shelter and from the mission shelter. Father Cieslik and two or three others went with them. At first, when they got among the rows of prostrate houses, they did not know where they were. The change was too sudden. From a busy city of 245,000 that morning to a mere pattern of residue in the afternoon, the asphalt of the streets was still so soft and hot from the fires that walking was uncomfortable. They encountered only one person, a woman, who said to them as they passed, my husband is in those ashes. At the mission where Mr. Tanamoto left the party, Father Kleinsorg was dismayed to see the building raised. In the garden on the way to the shelter, he noticed a pumpkin roasted on the vine. He and Father Cieslik tasted it, and it was good. They were surprised at their hunger, and they ate quite a bit. They got out several bags of rice and gathered up several other cooked pumpkins and dug up some potatoes that were nicely baked under the ground and started back. Mr. Tanamoto rejoined them on the way. One of the people with him had some cooking utensils. In the park, Mr. Tanamoto organized the lightly wounded women of his neighborhood to, cur to cook. Father Kleinsorg offered the Nakamura family some pumpkin, and they tried it, but they could not keep it on their stomachs. Altogether, the rice was enough to feed nearly a hundred people. Just before dark, Mr. Tanamoto came across a 20-year-old girl, Mrs. Kamai, the Tanamoto's next-door neighbor. She was crouching on the ground with the body of her infant daughter in her arms. The baby had evidently been dead all day. Mrs. Kamai jumped up when she saw Mr. Tanamoto and said, Would you please try to locate my husband? Mr. Tanamoto knew that her husband had been inducted into the army just the day before. He and Mrs. Tanamoto had entertained Mrs. Kamai in the afternoon to make her forget. Kamai had reported to the Chicago regional army headquarters near the ancient castle in the middle of town where some 4,000 troops were stationed. Judging by the many maimed soldiers Mr. Tanamoto had seen during the day, he surmised that the barracks had been badly damaged by whatever it was that had hit Hiroshima. He knew he hadn't a chance of finding Mrs. Kamai's husband, even if he searched, but he wanted to humor her. I'll try, he said. You've got to find him, she said. He loved our baby so much. I want him to see her once more.